Donald Gibson, partner and principal consultant at SRK. In a, a small descriptive form, what does that actually mean? Well, that means I have a, a management responsibility in the company, um, and hence I'm a, a partner in the organization. And principal consultant refers to my technical uh, capabilities as a consultant in a, a technical form of practice. We've got a, a very diverse business, and we consult in um, sustainability management in general. How diverse is that consultancy, for instance, from one end of the spectrum to the other end? Is it very diverse? Well, it, it is diverse in that we do traditional environmental and social studies and assessments that, uh, that many other consultancies used to do, and particularly from a compliance perspective. But that, that, that spreads into the private sector, that spreads into the donor sector and into the public, public sector for, for government. So we do a lot of policy advisory work for, for, the, uh, for the South African government and for other governments around the world. And, um, and we do auditing and assurance work, we do stakeholder engagement work, we have a social team that looks after socioeconomic issues and, and governance related issues. So the team is very diverse. We have, we have environmental scientists, we have communication specialists, we have economists, we have anthropologists um, and, and business specialists. Are we in one of those eras that is a major change on the horizon for the way business is done in South Africa? Well, I would think in South Africa, but I would think in, in, in global terms as well. The, the, the tipping, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether we've reached the tipping point of whether issues such as sustainability and ethics, social responsibility have been ingrained into business as in a systemic way, or whether it's an add-on or a bolt-on to, uh, to, uh, to the way business has, has uh, viewed itself and operated over the last uh, 200 years or so. And what we are seeing is that codes of governance, such as the King III Code on Corporate Governance in South Africa and the Code for Responsible Investment in South Africa and the Companies Act related to those, and our plethora of environmental and social legislation has started codifying sustainability and ethical requirements in the way business operates. I know you are very keen to talk about the mining uh, sector, so I'm going to go on to that because the sustainability of mining companies is foremost in most South African businessmen's minds because it was the number one income of this country at one time. It's hit many complexities recently in recent years. The strategies, the complexities, the uncertainties, be it political or be it, uh, uh, we say, misappropriation of funds, and so on and so on. How would you look at that? My, my response is that complexity is, is the nature of the beast. Complexity is increasing um, and uncertainty is increasing. And particularly in an emerging market context where we've got huge dynamics going on, whether it be large growth, large changes in, in, in political structures and personalities that are coming, coming to the place, uh, huge uh, huge developmental challenges that that really need to be uh, to be solved uh, this this sort of complexity um, coupled with things like weak governance in 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 many countries in in a in africa um, be it from a capacity perspective or a political will perspective uh, that creates huge uncertainty and for for mining companies and resource companies and infrastructure development companies that are expanding into Africa, into these emerging markets, into dynamic markets, it, it creates a huge risk for them if they don't proactively manage that risk. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit more on this one. Do we have very much more time before this has to be resolved? I, I don't think so. I think this is an immediate challenge that companies have. Many directors have said that the King III Code and, and its, uh, its guideline documents have gone too far in mainstreaming sustainability and corporate citizenship and ethics into the requirements of companies. Well, on the other hand, I, I think that this is exactly what is needed. And the concept of integrated reporting, where sustainability issues become the key issues that affect the ability of the company to, to create value in the short, medium and long term, so there's really an integration of, of sustainability into the strategy of the organization and the value creation potential. I think that's a huge development which is going to see this, this integration much more closely happen over the next uh, 
the next few years. But I think it's absolutely critical, especially in, in a country like South Africa and a continent like Africa, where we've got such uh, dire social development needs. This has to be resolved now so that we can start solving some of those problems. We have uh, many people who disagree with the way that we have um, governance in South Africa at the moment, i.e. Uh, there, there are wasted millions, we could put it that way. It's very difficult for us to say we have a social responsibility with all those wasted millions and then preach to the rest of Africa how to do it. Well, I think there, there are probably a whole bunch of negatives that for example, the ones you've mentioned, but I also think there are a, a, a large mass of people that believe that uh, we've made huge progress and that some of the aspects of our governance are on the right track. Um, if you look at service delivery around sanitation, electricity, water provision, etc., there, there has been huge development and huge progress made in, in, in certain yeah. aspects of that. That's, I do accept what you're saying, you're quite right in that. There has been gigantic footsteps forward in certain areas but not in others. Uh, one area I do want to bring up with you which is an, a thing that I think is on a lot of people's minds but you have to be uh, very lateral in your thinking is involuntary resettlement. Now that can create enormous social problems. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's one of the so-called big five social issues that we see in, in the mining sector, specifically in an African context. And there's never a lack of complexity. No matter how well the resettlement planning and implementation happens, there's never a lack of complexity and, and grievance around the resettlement process. For example, the compensation rates for a family that's, that's lost a, a, a piece of land to grow food on um, is often determined by the, the, the government and the country and the legislation so, and doesn't necessarily meet international standards for, 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 uh, for livelihood uh, restoration. And so we, we've got this, this challenge in, in, in national standards, national governance standards and international standards and applying those standards because what we're saying in sustainable business is really that the company needs to take responsibility and be accountable for the, all the impacts that it has positive and negative mm. and needs to avoid where possible the negative impacts and minimize those that it can't can't avoid and involuntary resettlement unfortunately has has two sides of the coin you know often it's 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 necessary for infrastructure and mines and and, um, and energy infrastructure for example that uh, that have a national a national focus and a national benefit but the local community itself might need to be resettled to, uh, to, to compensate for that. So where's the justice in that? And often these are very difficult issues that are very difficult to resolve with communities, with governments, and it really requires a multiple stakeholder approach to, to solving some of these problems. And it's not only, of course, unfortunately applicable to the mining industry, it's in the farming industry suffers that problem. There's tribal land that's sitting there that could be used and, uh, and, and, it's, uh, and then there's talk of expropriation and so on and so on. And they're the negative side of things. I think the positive side of things is that, and I'm sure you're going to agree with me here, is that we have not taken that route that Zimbabwe took, for instance. That hasn't taken place. And that maybe is a very positive step for us in the future, that we can sustain what we've got but grow elsewhere where we can. Well, I, I think that might be a positive benefit, but if you look at the land redistribution uh, program in South Africa, that's been a failure in, in many people's eyes. And that's been a failure because land that has been transferred to previously disadvantaged in, individuals um, is, is currently unproductive or not as productive as it should be. So the sustainability of those farms and that land is, is challenged. Um, we've also got a huge amount of land that is is owned by government and and is in the public public uh, um, interest that isn't being transferred to previously disadvantaged individuals. There's a massive tract in the Eastern Cape, for instance. Absolutely, they're in many of the provinces, mm. and so those types of aspects need to be looked at if land transformation redistribution is to be uh, put on a more successful footing. You talked about the five areas as, as, uh, of issues that impact on business in Africa. To, to end this, what, to 
add up, to sort of summarise, what are those five points that you would make that create the, the biggest impact? Well, from a social perspective, yes. um, involuntary resettlement is, 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 is one of the key ones. And we, we seeing a very complex uh, situation around managing resettlement. Um, but we also seeing positive benefits that come from resettle, resettled uh, communities and the livelihoods that are restored and improved from that. We, we also seeing artisanal mining as one of the major challenges that mining companies have. In, in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Ghana, in Mali, artisanal miners often use that as a livelihood. Whether it's illegal or legal, they use it as a livelihood to, to, to support themselves and their families. And that needs to be respected. So you've got a, a situation where you've got artisanal miners using a resource. You've got a so-called legal right to the land owned by an international mining company. And now you've got a land conflict that has to be managed. Situations around Africa, for example, have um, former militia working as artis artisanal miners, and that's actually been a, an amazing success story in getting people out of, uh, out of combat and, and fighting into a sustainable livelihood. But now you've got that conflict with a, with a, a global mining company coming in to, to, to take and use those resources. And that is a complex, complex situation that needs to be managed very delicately. By, by mining companies. Um, we also are looking at socioeconomic development or corp formerly known as, as, as corporate social investment and known as CSI in many parts of the world, CSR. And that in, a, in an African context is, is hugely important. Uh, we've got so many social issues to, to deal with, social problems that we need to solve uh, that uh, the contributions of mining companies specifically have been very important in, in solving those problems. Uh, but I think further, further work needs to be done on rebranding uh, mining companies as not extractive companies who extract materials and process them, but actually developmental companies that use the extraction of resources and the capacity they have to develop the communities and the countries they work in. So it's, 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 it's around a rebranding of what the mining industry stands for. And Trevor Manuel and Mark Kudafani and others have spoken about that situation and the need to resolve that. So, that, so that's very important as well. 